brothers, we are back. It is Matthew chapter 11. We're going to finish this chapter off here tonight. Um, I got to say, I'm very excited about Matthew chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 12. I've actually been very excited about everything I've been reading here out of Matthew. And uh, again, this I'm kind of discovering a lot of this stuff uh, alongside you. So as I'm bringing this to you, this, I'm just soaking it all up. But Matthew chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 12, oh my, like the, the last half here, they, they flow together very, very well. And we're going to talk about some things that are probably going to make us uncomfortable. And, uh, and actually, as the minister of a church, this stuff makes me feel extremely uncomfortable. Um, because, well, well, we'll just have to wait. A lot of that's going to come out this Sunday, but Sunday is going to be a barn burner. I'm pretty excited about, uh, uh, about Sunday. Um, but in terms of what we've been talking about so far in Matthew chapter 11, if you've been following with us here, the first half of the chapter is about John the Baptist and his seemingly decreasing faith. He is seeing all these miracles that are going on around him. You would think that he would be filled with faith. And yet he is asking like, uh, are you the one who's supposed to come? He's like sending his messengers to Jesus. Like, you're not acting like a rabbi or like a Messiah is supposed to be acting. And uh, we, we talked all through that. So I don't need to recap that, but basically he had a, he didn't have the quite the right understanding of Jesus. And when we don't have the right understanding of scripture and of Jesus, it leads us down to some very, very bad paths. After that gets addressed, Jesus goes and he then talks to the crowds that are around him. And he really starts going to bat for John he starts talking very positively about John, and then he actually turns it on the audience and, and really kind of rips into them. There seems to be, this was my, my personal observation, it almost seems like when, he, when, when Jesus heard from John, like a little spirit of John came into Jesus. Jesus has been talking a little bit about the Pharisees. He's been kind of overtly sharing some things. But now he's going for it. I mean, he goes right for the jugular. And so with that in mind, let's pick it up here. Matthew chapter 11 in verse 20. Okay. Yeah, this first line of, uh, of, of verse 20 kind of says it all. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have, uh, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, uh, Capernaum, w will you be lifted to the heavens? No. You will go down to Hades, for if the miracles that you perform uh, that that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Let that sink in for a second. You are a well. Actually, let's go, let's give the context here. Again, if you go to chapter 11 and verse 1, where is Jesus preaching here? And it says here, after Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. The towns of Galilee, these are the religious towns. This is where the Pharisees are kind of setting up shop. And if you, as a religious person, because, you know, we're kind of religious people, right? If you, as a religious person, you got to hear from Jesus and his message, his sermon to you that morning was this, that Sodom, Sodom is going to go to heaven before you go to heaven. That's troubling. That's very troubling. I do not want Jesus to say that about me. And, and, and Jesus is going after it uh, very, very hard here. And so we're going to go beneath the surface, dun, 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 and I'm going to share my screen. And we're going, to, uh, we're going to have some fun here. But let me kind of uh, share with you guys. Okay, here we go. Hopefully you guys can see that. That is the Sea of Galilee. Let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Oh, I can. Yes. Brilliant. 
maybe. Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. I realize this is a, uh, um, <laughs> this is not a, uh, a Google Earth image here, but hey, amen. I found it and it kind of makes the point. But if we look here, the Bible says that Jesus is in the, in the region of Galilee. Okay. So that's the Sea of Galilee and that kind of top left, kind of the northwestern part of the Sea of Galilee. That is all the area of Galilee. There are three specific towns that are mentioned here. And Jesus said that he's done miracles in these three specific towns. Did you catch that? He says that he, he did miracles in Chorazin, which you see that at the very top, Chorazin. Bethsaida, which you see that also, again, the north part of uh, Galilee, or the Sea of Galilee. And Capernaum. Capernaum is kind of the, the home base, if you will. And he, this is the area where he says that he's been doing the miracles, but the people in response to the miracles did not repent. It's not that they didn't believe the miracles. It's that they did not repent as a result of the miracles. Okay? So what you're looking at here, and you can kind of see it, they call it the evangelical triangle. That's Chorazin, Capernaum, Bethsaida. This is where Jesus spends the majority of his three years doing ministry. It's in these three particular spots. And a little bit about these places. Um, oh, so it's called the Evangelical Triangle because this is where Jesus uh, kind of set up shop. But these areas are massive Pharisee territory. They're massive Pharisee. This is where the Pharisees are. The Pharisees are not in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is kind of run by the group called the Sadducees. And those are the ones, those are the chief priests and the teachers of the law. We read about that. They're the ones that are in Jerusalem, but that's not where Jesus is. Jesus is with these Pharisees. And they live up here. And the Pharisees believe that you don't necessarily need to live in Jerusalem and do all the stuff in the temple to still be spiritual. So that's kind of the thing. Okay. These three towns are highly religious, highly religious. And they say that if you go through them, and uh, most of them are pretty much rubble with the exception of uh, Capernaum. But if you go through Capernaum, they, um, if, when you go through them, they say there's something very striking about it. And that is, it is plain Jane. There is no architecture. There is no paintings anywhere. There's no art on the wall. These things are just kind of uh, the, the lifestyle there. It was super, super religious. And specifically, the Pharisees did not want to have any influence by the Greeks or by the Romans. And so the Greeks and the Romans were all about that art and all about that kind of expression, not so in uh, Capernaum. They were all about reading scripture. There was a lot to like about these Pharisees. They get, they get a rough gig here, but there's a lot to like. By the way, I'm going. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I think it costs about three grand, two grand, three grand a person. I'm telling you, in the next five years, I am going. I'm so excited about the stuff that I'm reading. I think we need to get a team of people, save your pennies, but let's get over there, right? Like, let, I want to go look at this stuff. So there's a number of different tours that are out there uh, that are actually led by disciples. So save your pennies, guys. We're going. I want to get there. All right. Anyway. Um, so anyway, so Jesus comes up really, really hard on, on these guys. And let me, I'll do my stop share here. I'll come back to you. Okay, I'm back. Um, so Jesus is obviously coming down really hard on these guys, but what's interesting is these guys are actually very religious. And in terms of knowing their Bible, the kids in the, in this town of Capernaum would know their Bible better than you would. And, uh, well, never mind you, they would know their Bible better than I would. These people knew their Bible. They were serious about God and they were serious about the scriptures. So as much junk as we throw at them, there is a lot to like about these Pharisees. They just seemingly have this one massive blind spot. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So the comparison that he gives to these towns, the first is to uh, Chorazin and to, uh, um, uh, da, 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 top of my head, come on, Ryan, Bethsaida, there you go. He compares them to Tyre and Sidon, Tyre and Sidon. And the third one he compares to Sodom. Now, we're very familiar with Sodom. We know what Sodom was all about, right? That is a place of, there, there was massive sexual sin. But there was also, I mentioned this the other day, a lack of hospitality. God gets rid of it. He said, this, this place is gone. 
He has no toleration for that. Well, he actually compares them to Sodom. That's not a comparison you want. But the others are Tyre and Sidon. Well, why Tyre and Sidon? And uh, that's kind of the question of the day. And I unfortunately don't have two. I don't, I don't necessarily have the answer to that. But I got a couple guesses. Number one, Tyre and Sidon are also both coastal areas. And one more screen share. Do, do, do. I think it's this one. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, okay, here we go. So you see Tyre and Sidon right here. And uh, Tyre and Sidon were not in Israel. So they were not part of, you know, they weren't in Israel. And as you can see, the cities of them specifically are right on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And so Tyre and Sidon are compared to these other kind of port areas of Bethsaida and uh, Chorazin. And so, um, so there's kind of, they have that in, in you know, They've got some similarities there. But if the differences are massive. So that's kind of their similarities. Um, but the differences here. Oh, did I not share that? Uh-oh. Okay. Well, hopefully you guys saw that. Anyway, <laughs> the differences are, are pretty striking. And these places were horribly sinful. Uh, there are 70 different references to Tyre in the Old Testament. There are 50 references to Sidon in the Old Testament. There's about 38 references to Sodom in the Old Testament. And good luck between those 120, 150, 150 different references in the Old Testament, good luck finding a single prophet that said something nice about those areas and about those people. Good luck finding one scripture that says, oh yeah, these people are awesome. This comparison is not meant to be pleasing in any way, shape, or form. Tyre and Sidon were evil. And if you go through, I just picked out a few of them. Isaiah chapter 23 talks about Tyre. And, uh, and it, it, it's coming down on them because Tyre's got a place. Of, I mean, whenever you're a port city like that, you're going to have a lot of money. Um, they were well known for their prostitution. Isaiah 23, he, he wails on them for that. Um, Ezekiel chapters 26, 27, and 28. The king of Tyre actually believes that he is a god. And this is actually the, 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 the scripture in uh, Ezekiel 28, where a lot of people say, oh, he's talking about Satan there. Technically, he's talking about the king of Tyre. Okay, Tyre's not good. Um, Joel chapter 3, it talks about the uh, Tyre and Sidon, how they sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem into slavery. They were slave traders. Jesus is just. So let's kind of put this all together. Let's put this all together. Jesus is in the most religious of religious places. And he's talking to the people and he's saying, you people are going to have it worse than those that were committing sodomy. You guys are going to have it worse than those that were engaged in prostitution. You're going to have it worse than those who were being led by somebody who called himself a God. You're actually going to have it worse than slave traders. You are going to have it worse. This is stunning. This is shocking. This is hard to hear for these people. Like, what on earth have these people done that this is going to be the judgment that is going to come to them? What is it that they have failed to repent of? And these sins are clearly worse than what these other, you know, horrible things that I just talked about. What is it that they did? And and this is really what the Gospel of Matthew is all about. It keeps talking about these sins over and over again. In Matthew chapter 23, specifically, though, I can't wait till we get to Matthew 23. Oh, boy, we'll do some deep, fun D groups on that. But he talks about seven different sins that the, the, that the Pharisees were committing that God absolutely despised. More or less, though, what it comes down to is this. They didn't love people. They were the representatives of God, but they didn't love people. Not, not only did they not love them, they actively hated other people and taught others to do the same. They said, do not go to the house of those, of those wretched tax collectors and sinners. Do not go to those Samaritans. Shake the dust out of your feet. These people hated you if you were not one of them. And they were the representatives of God. And God hates that. 
And there's all kinds of warnings for us as disciples of Jesus. If we're not going to be loving, boy, we've got problems. Like this is major bad if we are not loving people, and specifically if we're not loving people that the world doesn't already love. Do you hear me on that? There's some other things that, that they talk about, right? These, these, these Pharisees, they were the actors. And actors meaning they actually did what they said. They weren't hypocrites in that way, but it wasn't their heart. They did everything for show. They make their phylacteries wide and that everything is made for show. But I want to read Matthew chapter 23, verse 40 here. And it says this. This is the, one of the major critiques of the Pharisees. And there's a reason I want to read this one. It says they tie up heavy cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So I want you to keep that image in mind, keep that image in mind that the, that Jesus is upset that these Pharisees throw heavy burdens for the people to carry. Okay. What's the words here? Heavy cumbersome loads. And with that in mind, let's keep reading. We'll finish off chapter 11. We're going to pick it up here in verse 25. And he says, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Now listen to this, okay? Remember those heavy loads that he, he, he was not happy those Pharisees were making their people carry. Verse 28, come to me, all you who are weary and what? Burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, what does that mean? Take my yoke upon you. Again, a little beneath the surface here, but these are, these are code words, okay? Take my yoke upon you. The yoke of someone, of a rabbi, was known as his teaching and his interpretation of scripture. And so if you were going to follow the yoke of Shammai, you would follow the teachings of Shammai. And so you would take those upon you. That was your rabbi. And whatever Shammai believed, you kind of took that with you. Or the yoke of Hillel or the yoke of whatever rabbi that was out there. Jesus has just explained the yoke of the Pharisees. The yoke of the Pharisees is burdensome. The yoke of the Pharisees is heavy. Remember? They tie up those heavy, cumbersome loads. That is the yoke. So if you're going to follow the Pharisees, your life as a religious man, you're going to be filled with burdens. You're going to be filled with all these loads. You're going to feel like you're constantly carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. Jesus is saying, you got the wrong yoke. Take on my yoke. And what does he describe his yoke as? He says, my yoke is light. And that doesn't mean, it says easy, but that doesn't mean easy like, hey, we do whatever we want. It means easy from a different perspective. It means I'm not loading you with all of these rules and all of these commands that you have to follow, right? I'm going to load you with the truth and the scriptures and the love of God. Yeah, we're going to follow God. Yeah, we're going to lose our lives for it. We're going to get persecuted. It's just going to be some real challenges. But you know what? It's going to be awesome because we are going to be doing God's will. Um, to take a quote from Larry, oh, it's not Larry's quote, but the Pharisees' style of ministry was this. You ready, Larry? Larry and I laugh about this every week. He's got a little phrase. He says, the beatings will continue until morale improves. I love that. The beatings will continue until morale improves. That's the Pharisees, right? That's a, you know, work harder. You got to do more. Like you, like it's loading the people with all of this guilt and shame and burden and all that. That's the yoke of the Pharisees. That is not the yoke of Jesus. 
But if we're not careful, guys, we actually start taking more of that yoke rather than the light and easy yoke. And you know, especially you've been around. Rusty has been around 30 years. Rusty knows the days where we put maybe a little too much uh, heavy burden on some of our yoke, right? But the yoke of Jesus is light and it's easy. And what does it bring? It brings rest for our souls. It comes in the form of gentleness and humility. This is the yoke of Jesus. And honestly, guys, this is going to be the, you know, we're going to get into chapter 12. And chapter 12 is a real life example of this. It's a real life example of how the Pharisees put this massive yoke on the people. And Jesus is going to come through and tear it right off in chapter 12. So we're going to, so this will, this is kind of a little preview for chapter 12, but it's going to be awesome. Anyway, I've spoken a lot here. Um, I want to leave time for you for some discussion groups. And so let me put up a question on here. And this is going to be our question for the discussion groups. And um, I, I want you to think about this. But ask yourself, as a disciple of Jesus, do you feel weary and burdened? Or do you feel that following Jesus is easy and light? As a disciple of Jesus, do you feel weary and burdened by your walk with God? That everything is guilt. Everything is, oh, like, do you just always feel terrible about yourself? Or is your underlying feeling as a disciple that, man, this is awesome, and you would describe it as easy and light? Now, my guess, I'm going to leave that up there, and then uh, we'll break in here. Let me close out with this. My guess is most of us are probably going to say weary and burdened. I don't know that, but that's just my guess. And, and that's okay. It's okay. It's, it's better to identify this stuff than just not to analyze it at all, right? But let me give you, if your answer is weary and burden, we're going to go off to our groups. We're not going to come back together. So let me just kind of leave you with this. That if you feel like your walk with God and your obedience to scripture feels more weary and burden, let me give you a challenge for the rest of the month. I want you to concentrate specifically on really enjoying your walk with God. I want you to change your prayers and I want you to have way less confession and way less forgive me, God, and more praise, more thanksgiving, and more hallowed be your name. By the way, thanks for uh, two weeks ago for uh, step filling in for me, guys, while I was on vacation. When you mess up, when you struggle, okay, I want you to concentrate on having more about grace and forgiveness than I want you to think about judgment and how terrible you are. And when I want, and when you just find yourself in a general state of not feeling great just about your walk with God, I'm going to ask you all to memorize verse 30. Okay, it's really not hard. You already have it memorized probably. And the, verse 30 just says this, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so every time you're feeling heavy, every time you're feeling like, man, this, like I stink at Christianity. I'm not doing good. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. I want you just to go back and to just to just play it through your head. Verse 30, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So amen, guys. That's the end of our lesson. If you're uh, watching online, thanks so much for joining the Cleveland Church. Amen.